Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back, everybody, to the Astro Imaging Channel. We've missed you. We've been gone for two weeks, but we've all been celebrating in airports and uh, under the Christmas tree and around the around the candles and everything else. So I hope you all had a really good vacation, um, time off. I hope you survived the weather. It was pretty severe all over. Um, and I hope everything's going fine because it's certainly going fine around here. I'm going to tell you a few things that you need to know about some upcoming shows while the late people filter in a little bit. And we're going to have some good times coming up over the next few months. Uh, we've already got them scheduled up. Going to the calendar. Oh, I got ahead of myself there. Uh, today is, oops, where did that go? Where did that happen? Get out of here. Yes, let's print the website. <laughs> uh, today's Dave Pearson, uh, and he's going to tell us about his remote observatory scheduling and control. And then next week coming in, uh, Daniel Mumi is going to be telling us about the new IOPTRA. Daniel, you're out there right now, aren't you? I'm going to uh, yeah, stop right. sharing for a second and let you talk for a little bit there. Um, what are you going to tell us about next week? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it's right here, sitting on top of this 8-inch uh, Edge HD. I'm going to be uh, providing an overview, overview about recent changes to the amateur mount market, uh, particularly in reference to the strain wave drives that are uh, right behind me. I was lucky enough to be the first customer in the U.S. to get a hold of the new Ioptron Hybrid Equatorial Mount 44. Uh, it's a 20 kilogram payload. It's pretty awesome, in my opinion, of course, because I bought it. Um, so that's a hybrid strain wave design, like I said, and I'll cover all the little aspects about it, as well as its performance and the accessories that come with it, as well as the alternatives on the market um, and how they might compare. So I think it's going to be a fun time. Over. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, we're looking forward to that. I have had a mount going dead for a while here and uh, was worried a little bit about what I was going to replace it with and considering that mount. Luckily, I found some old Los Mondi parts, as one always does with Los Mondi, and I think I can avoid buying a new mount at this time. At any rate, uh, just looking forward to the calendar. We are pretty much full up through the month of, month of February, and we're all the way into March. We've got some pretty interesting shows, but as always, we need more. So we always suggest that you contact us at the Astro Imaging Channel here. Tell us who you are. Tell us what you want to do a program about. We'll ask you a few questions, and we'll get you to do a program for us. Um, also, we want you to know that you've still got some time to turn in your um, uh, data, your work on Terry's data for NGC 55. Remember, we do these TAIC workshops where workshops, there we go, workshops. This is all these different versions of this image right here all came from the same data set. I think that was Eric's a couple of workshops ago. And it's always fascinating to see how everybody processes the same data. So you go over here, you click on this, and you get the data from uh, Terry's NGC 55. And when you're finished processing it, you submit it here. You can also go back and do all of the different workshops we've had for quite some time now. So uh, that'll give you some data to practice your stuff, and you can see how other people processed it out. One other thing we want you to know about is here's your little club over here. All you guys, Rex's here and, and Linda Thomas Fowler's here and Marsha's here. Everybody's here. And I'm glad to see you back after your, your vacation away from us and with your families, I hope, and things like that. At any rate, um, here's why you ask your questions. You ask your questions. Eric's going to organize them. And then every once in a while, he's going to interrupt the presentation and ask them so you can get your stuff asked. Uh, you can also, you'll notice that we're, we've are we got up to 14.3 subscribers, and that means it's time for you to uh, click on the um, uh, click on the subscribe if you haven't already subscribed for us. One other thing I want you to note is that um, on the calendar, which I forgot to mention when I was going through the calendar here, uh, we are very pleased that Neith and NIAC are coming back the Sunday of April 16th, which means it starts on, I think, Thursday. Friday is NIAC, the Northeast Astro Imaging Conference. And so get yourself registered for that. Get your hotel reservations. Show up and enjoy it all. And then we're going to go into um, NEAF on Saturday and Sunday. And because we hope to be there, 
we won't be here with you. So we had to say, hey, we're not going to have a program that day. And anyway, that's enough about us and what the plans are for the future. Let's all get back to, I'll stop sharing here, and we'll all get back to um, um, uh, David tonight. Dave tonight is going to be telling us about some remote observatory scheduling and stuff like that. Dave, take it away. Okay. charts yeah uh well we're yes we're seeing the the title slide you know yeah. down there at the bottom you see that thing that says uh stop sharing and then hide next to that right. there we go click on that and that'll get rid of that little thing for the rest of the okay and if you need to get back there you just press escape and you can get back okay yeah. Dave? so okay. go ahead you sound good thanks uh well first of all i want to thanks uh, molly for coming up with a better title than i had so i was i like like her new title she gave me. So tonight's presentation, we're going to talk about an automated image control program for use at a remote observatory that is capable of unattended multiple night imaging using a scheduler. We're going to talk about how to generate the image optics text file that we use to schedule. Give you a slideshow example of the program in operation. Talk about the planner scheduler design. And then if we have time, I have some extra material you may be interested in, in terms of statistics of the amount of time for one degree temperature change, for those that are thinking about focusing, refocusing every one degree. And I have some unique hardware. I thought maybe if we had time, we could go through and give some people ideas in terms of what they may want to do with their observatory. First of all, I need to acknowledge the folks that helped make my project successful. First of all was Greg Kinney, who responded to my forum request for hardware plans and software that accomplished protecting the telescope from internet and power outages. Dave Brady at Focus Max for his ready to use scripts to control Focus Max. Matt Thomas at CCD Commander. We worked together to solve a CCD command injury, and I learned a lot from him. Ray at Astrophysics, who helped me in APCC and ASCOM. Doug at MaxMDL, which helped me clarify nuances within MaxMDL scripts. Bruce Waddington inspired me to attempt this project as he had written his own imaging script. And last, uh, acknowledge Ken Elkert for editing my presentation, although I essentially pretty much rewrote it since he's edited it. So any errors, grammatical errors are on me. So let's start off talking about what do I mean by remote observing? So I'm talking about one remote computer connected to an on-site computer telescope system. Two computers can be connected by internet, ethernet, or Wi-Fi. Computer to computer distances can be any, any separation. And the roof opening and closing can be controlled by a user image script, a group observatory system, or a moderator. So the first scenario, what is I call observer, observer control, which is telescope equipment be controlled by a user at all times. I think that's probably how we all started. Second one is a hybrid telescope equipment is being controlled by a user for part time. And then generally the script takes over at the time of after meridian crossing, tired or time to go to bed. First one I'm talking about is fully automated. This would be a script that controls the nightly imaging schedule without user involvement. And of course, the difference is confidence in equipment, available hardware systems and settings and unique equipment software. So this kind of give you a detailed design timeline. So I was a visual observer until 2012 when I started imaging with an Iotron William Optics 81. Upgraded my scope in 2016 and March 2019 moved the telescope to remote observatory. Started writing my script in the summer of 2019. By the fall of 2019, I was using the program to turn on off equipment, power, monitor the rift and weather and observatory cameras. And finally, in November 2021, I started system testing of all code with hardware and software. But here's an overview of my equipment. So I have an AP 1200 mount and two telescopes and two cameras, 12 inch RC at 1700, and 81 millimeter William Optic EPO at 
380. Two S big cameras, a mono and color camera. I has a, a data con power data controller, the Pegasus version one. I have two external power supplies, one for the mount, one for Pegasus. I have a custom do light shield with do straps, an econometer for in case I lose home position, a UPS power backup system, and a light panel connect to the wall. And you can see the picture over here on the right. And the software I'm using is Maxim DL with Pinpoint, Focus Max version 4, now converting to version 5, and APCC, which is Astrophysics Command Center, which I have my horizon and meridian limits. So there are a lot of existing planners and schedulers out there. You can see a few here. I'm sure I don't have them all, but these are the ones I'm familiar with. I would consider almost all these as being single night planners with the observer being the scheduler. Um, the one, two differences is I understand Voyager's come out with the new advanced version, which has a scheduler. Don't know anything about it, just what I've heard. And of course, APC has always had a scheduler since day one. So when I first started this, I had to decide whether to buy or build. So the imaging script program that I was using could not recover after weather pause or rush closure without a restart by the user. It was getting very time consumed to not update the nightly imaging schedule, determining what object image, plan the imaging sequence, and manually transcribe to the script. And as I just mentioned, majority of imaging script programs out there are suitable for single night observation and would require the user to schedule. And as I mentioned, ACP was the only one that had that capability. However, it was expensive, it had capability that it would never use. And it so it looked like I was going to have to spend some time learning ACP, write my own scripts to get everything I wanted. So on the other hand, I wanted to learn ASCOM, how to write scripts, and write my own astronomy program and app. I already had a lot of the equations in place in Excel that I could use for this project. So I finally decided if I was going to have to learn any program and write my own scripts, it would be better use of my time to write my own program that I could fix quickly and that capability as required. We kind of look in the program overview. So this is a screenshot of the program in operation on a 24 inch monitor. So the out window is Maxim DL with this camera control at the bottom right, observatory window in the upper right with this tracking window and the uh, pictures are being taken. So the bottom left is my program, and we'll go to more detail in the next chart. This is the blow up the main control window for my program. So I'll start in the upper left, the observing site status, which is time and, and sidereal times, latitude one, sunset, sunrise times, twilight and start times, moonrise, moonset times, and moon illumination. Below that is weather status, the text files coming over from the weather sensors. The rough status is next to it, the text file coming over from that. Next to that is the cameras, internal and external to the, into the observatory. Up above that is power switch control, which tells me what hardware is being connected or not connected. The left of that is the, what I call the safety monitor and mount status. This is basically what the mount is saying it's pointed at and whether it's parked or tracking. I also have time to transit down here that operates. We've gone over to the upper right under image control, have the completion or the connection of Maxim DL, the camera set point for cooler. What is the camera temperature at the current time? What's the power? What the object is currently being shot, what the filter bin is, and the status is basically my log file that keeps track of what's the program currently doing. And then also up here, I have output from Focus Max. I don't usually have that log up and running, it's hidden because it gives me the answer here on my main screen, so I don't have to go back and forth. At the bottom side, I have the manual image control, which you can run manually, although I found it was just as easy to run Max from. Focus Max in manual mode than, than trying to use the automated program. I might just mention that when the program first comes up, it's already in auto mode. 
so to the auto definition on here so at the proper time the power power up occurs and then when it's time to start imaging you'll automatically do that at the bottom row i have how to execute the program Open Image Planner Telescopus is the planner if you like to go look at that. I have different weather forecasts you can call up. I have a C schedule in terms of the program will compute a schedule for the month. Then I added that almost all the high end mounts and other lower, medium um, mounts only have certain ASCOM capability. So just so I would know what my current system was, I build a little check that would go through and tell me what ASCOM capability was available to my system. So kind of going through the control app, it's a Microsoft Windows 10, a Visual Basic.net executable program, primarily for telescopes in a permanent group observatory with no roof control, but with available roof and weather status text files. Key features are, of course, as I mentioned, it controls a web power switch to cycle equipment power, schedules the nightly imaging plan and updates that plan at the end of the night so it knows how much is completed for that night and get ready for the next night. Executes computed imaging schedule and then space equipment when complete. It has weather pause and restart capability. And as I mentioned, you can view and change the imaging plan before imaging begins. And then, of course, I have a user input for filter versus altitude and moon illumination versus moon separation constraints. And as I mentioned, can be controlled manually. But just to give you an example, if you are running the program and you want to see what the schedule is, you hit this little button down here and up comes the imaging plan database. This is all the. OK, so in my program, here's the major sequences. First is sunset, which starts the nightly sequence, calculates the sunrise set, moonrise set, and twilight end start times, and does the optic scheduling. At twilight end, start the sequence uh, begin, and powers up the equipment, starts up the software, cools down, and then starts the imaging sequence. Twilight start plus 15 minutes is the end of the imaging sequence, stops the guider, starts the equipment shutdown, disconnects all the software and hardware, and then powers down. I might just mention the reason I have twilight start for 15 minutes is that if I have an image that's running as twilight start occurs, I let it complete before I actually shut it down. And then sunrise comes, I reset parameters. I send an imaging log by email to the user or me. However, I might just mention that Gmail changed its requirements for third party access or sending emails. So currently it doesn't work. I got to go back and figure out how to fix it. And then, of course, Sunrise plus 30, it resets all the parameters the next day. So just I'm going to show you now an example of the operation of the script using simulators. The cameras are simulated, the mounts simulated. I'm not using Focus Max or APCC. And we're going to start at the beginning of the script and end its script completion. So here the screen script opens in auto mode. You can see the two auto things are set and it's initializing the program. Now it's waiting for sunset to occur, so nothing really happens until sunset. Now it's waiting for power on. Equipment starting equipment is powered on now. So PC is always on, focuser mounts and cameras are all on. And of course the cameras, the leaders all go through Pegasus. Then once it gets powered up, it's waiting for Maxim VL to start. And then it, once it starts, it connects the cameras, mount and focusers. You can see here Maxim VL is starting up or connecting, I should say. Maxim VL window comes up, the camera control window comes up. Connect the uh, ASCOM mounts. This is Maxim DL's connected. You can see the mounts up and running, unpark, tracking's off. Start a two step cool down. So it's, it cools down to a temperature close to where you want it, and then it stabilizes and then and goes down it to the final temperature. 
Now, one thing to note is Maxim, MaximDL did not put capability for scripts to open the track the graph tracking graph window or the observatory. So if you want to look at those, you have to bring them up manually. So here just showing our cooling the final temperature. And of course, I said you can go and look at the current schedule. So here's that chart again. Now it's waiting to start the sequence. Now, what I do may be different than other people, or maybe other people do this, is that I want to begin imaging at twilight end. I don't want to start cool down, I mean, start to go to the object and, and plate solve and focus at twilight end. I want to be imaging. So I start early and do all those things before I actually start the image taking. So I slew the target. Plate solve, do a sync completes here. See the picture in terms of the plate solve up here. And we go and acquire star focusing. I, I, of course, I'm using a simulator without focus max. So, but once focus max actually runs with the real focus max, then the focuser data appears on the window. So you get focuser position, temperature, ambient temperature, and the focus HFD that came out of the focus. Then acquire star focusing occurs and returns the sterns from the star and completes. Then we start the guider. Have a pre exposure delay. I wasn't really liking the maximum VL capability for delay, so I enhanced it with my own. And then the image sequence starts. And in this example that I ran, it was just one sequence, uh, H alpha, then one, and with one exposure of 600 seconds. We're going to exposing the camera or exposing the picture. Once it completes, it saves the image, starts equipment shutdown. I might just mention that the reason, you know, a lot of the programs out there, you have this big, huge log of which you can look at in a window what's going on. Since I'm automated, I didn't really see a reason to have to put in a 30 lines log in terms of what's been going on for that many steps. And so the status here is just one liner that tells you where it is in its sequence. So we, of course, park the mount first. And over here, it see it's parking, it's tracking still off. Start sensor warm up. End of sensor warm up, cameras uh, come off, disconnects, Max and DL disconnects, disconnects. Disconnect the ASCON mount, and then shuts off all power equipment. So this is shown as in the process of shutting off power, and this is when everything's complete. So, and then when you get completion, going back to the full up window, you get the window of the program that shows back up. In the script version, Max and DL windows close. However, I found the Pegasus, at least the version one, prevents Max and DL window from closing. So you have to close that manually. So that kind of gives you an overall view of the operation of the program. So let's talk about how I generate the input text file. So I use an Excel spreadsheet to combine the current and future imaging targets and their completion status. So each object that I'm shooting has three rows. The first has target, starter date, completion, what filters to run, what the bin is, and what's the total exposure time in hours. And over here for each filter, I have the number of exposures been collected with the exposure for each. And the third row is basically the subs that's been verified and determined as being good. So then the program uses those as being to know when it gets com uh, complete its, its set. And also keep track of total hours. I might just mention that you can mix up bin one, bin two. So for example, if you have an object, you're not sure whether you want to do bin one or bin two, you can actually do both. And then when you're ready to generate the plan, I have a macro in Excel, push the button, 
and up comes the object finding tech input text file as object rise central and deck filters sub exposure in minutes total exposure in hours what the bin is and the number of good subs that's that uh, the user has determined i know you see temperature here but this was my early version and i just never gone back to remove it i do this automatic automatically now which we'll cover that later okay kind of the big Part of tonight's presentation is the planner schedule, so we're going to go through that now. So, first of all, to develop a ske planner schedule requires numerous constraints. And all of you that do imaging know that you have to do what's in your head, but now when you automate it, you got to take what's in your head and put it on code to make, make it work. So, first, you need camera filter constraints, which is basically what altitude or air mass to use for each filter what moon constraints to be applied to each filter, and then what to do when the object's maximum altitude is below the filter attitude constraints. And then what's gonna be your minimum imaging altitude constraint, imaging time constraints, for example, astronomical twilight, astronomical start, and then how to prioritize all the constraints. So when we look up an object in the sky, we are looking through the atmosphere. And the lower the altitude, the more atmosphere we look through, and therefore higher the air mass. So there's an equation that gives you approximations for air mass that you're looking through, one over the cosine of the zenith angle. I might just mention this assumes a spherical Earth. And then if you plot that air mass chart over here on the right, you see from 90 to 40, it's fairly flat. At 30, it starts to get faster. At 20, it's faster, and it really takes off below 20 degrees. Now, some of the observatories have created an image quality metric to use in terms of what they think the image quality would be. They have two equations. One is strictly air mass, and the other is air mass times wavelength. So if I keep air mass constant, for example, you got filters red, green, blue, what the wavelengths are, and the CN metric, you can see the red has the lowest CN metric and blue has the highest. So with the red filter, as I mentioned, is the lowest, which allows the filter to be used at a lower altitude. And blue filter is the highest, which requires a higher altitude to remain the same C matrix. So the constraints that you need to worry about is minimum attitude. Uh, constraint must be defined. As I mentioned, lower the altitude, the higher the air mass and worse the image quality. Lower the altitude, higher the noise. And generally, it's pretty much recommended to not image below an altitude of 30 degrees. So for the program, you have to make a decision of how you're going to take each filter and decide what to do. Are you going to go for acceptable image quality, use image background noise as your metric, and for example, you need to decide whether you want to avoid the noise, process the noise, or compromise between the two. Now, as part of that, generally the image quality doesn't change much over one night, unless bad weather's on the way, of course. The day-to-day -day image quality can change quite dramatically from 5 to 15% or so. And of course, as the previous chart indicated, the red filter can image at a lower altitude than green, and green filter can be lower than a blue filter. So there's at least two philosophies in using imaging filters. You can image all the filters above 60 degrees, which gives you very good noise. However, by doing that, you're gonna have a shorter altitude time window to actually take pictures. You can accept a small amount of background noise, allowing the filters to be imaged for one object for a longer period of time. You have to accept more noise. However, because the background noise varies day to day, you basically have some variation anyway, so by using the background there on top of that, you're not really being impacted very much. So I, over several months, I collected a bunch of data for each filter for different altitudes and determined how the background air changed. So the zero reference point was 60 degree elevation for all filters. And at a recommended image altitude of 30 degrees for the red filter, you see that came at a 15% background air. Green filter comes out to be 40 degrees, blue filter above 50, 
And luminance, because it's so important in your processing, I keep it above 60 degree altitude to minimize the noise the most. Now moving on, you have to worry about moon filter constraints. As I hope all of you know, LRGB and O3 does not really like the moon at all. Although you can shoot within a few days of either side of the moon. Narrow band, H off and sodium can image with the moon up. And of course the background versus algae effects are the same as we discussed previously. However, moon illumination versus moon distance has a significant impact on the background. So if I apply my minimum imaging algae of 30 degrees for H alpha and sodium and an altitude background of 30 degrees, excuse me, 15 percent, I get the 30 degree altitude. Looking at the data that I use to determine all that, so I use an H alpha 6.5 nanometer filter, then to and did a background noise evaluation as a function of moon illumination and moon distance. And all the data here is referenced to a no moon reference. So we have mean background, background mean deviation, and background noise, all a function of moon distance and as a function of moon luminosity. So for full moon, the background increases rapidly as the moon separation becomes less than 40 to 50 degrees. At moon separation distances greater than 60 degrees, the background levels are almost constant, but they are about 50% higher than a no moon case. Above 90% moon illumination noise levels increases rapidly. For quarter moons, the background starts to increase slowly below a moon separation of about 40 degrees and levels are slightly higher than the no moon case. So those two filter Altitude constraints as well as moon constraints came in my final filter input text file. So this first row, first column is all the filters, bin one, bin two, what altitude limit that's been assigned, what the moon distance and moon illumination is. And of course for LRGB and O3, I'm not allowing moon to be up at all, so it's not applicable. H alpha, for example, at full moon, I allow a 60 degree moon distance. And the, the last column is filter weight score, and we'll talk about later. David, can I ask yeah. you a question? Sure. Can you go back one slide? Sure. Now, can the user, or if someone else were to use that, can they change these parameters if they want to you know, take more or less risk oh, on yeah. noise? Yeah, it's all interchangeable. You just update this file to whatever you want and you're up and running. And I think you, you showed your equipment, but I don't think you described what your equipment setup was. Um, in terms of what do you, what specifically? Your mount, your telescope, your camera. And, and, and oh, where, it, where it is, where is this stuff? It's in New Mexico at, at uh, Deep Sky West. Okay. And uh, yeah, I had a slide there it was AP 1200 with two cameras both S big, one mono, one color. Um, I, I can flip back there if you want to see. It. No, just which what cameras are you using? Which of the S bigs? Uh, I have an old STF 8300 mono with filter wheel. I got one of them. And um, then the ST 8300 color camera. So I use the, the uh, STF 8300 for the, the longer focal length telescope, the larger one. And then for wide field, I use the, the SP color camera. And your guider setup? And guider is basically uh, ultra star on the main scope and um, on the main scope. So I use that. And I do, of course, I do do auto guiding, of course. Um, let's see what else. So uh, I have a power cable and, and um, data cable up to Pegasus and then Everything distributes off of that to the cameras, focus wheels, uh, focuser, and dew straps. And your power controller? Um, I have two, two different um, uh, power supplies. Uh, I can't remember them, what the name of them are, one for the mount and one for Pegasus. I also, what I also did when I first 
just a little story. So when I first got Pegasus, was which one of the first ones that they made, I got it home, I plugged it into a power supply and started to smell smoke. And I burnt the board. And uh, so I called and says, well, you put too much voltage into it. And I go, well, according to the power supply company, they can't supply that much power. So anyway, they were fairly good about it. They took the thing back and fixed it. And I'm using the same power supply I used before, and I've had no problems with it since the new board. OK. OK. So now a little bit more detail of how I came up with the planner scheduler. The planner has four steps. First step is to apply the filter altitude constraint table you saw previously to all the object filter combinations. If the ob maximum altitude of the optic is less than the filter altitude limit, then the filter altitude limit is reduced until it's less than the maximum altitude. However, if the maximum altitude is below the lowest filter attitude, like 30 degrees, then the filter attitude constraint must be modified to allow imaging of that. Once you've got the altitude constraints, you define the time at which it hits the east and west side of the meridian. And that defines the start stop observing window of the object filter combination. Step three, you apply the moon distance constraints. And of course, if the moon separation distance versus illumination constraint is not met, the optic is removed from consideration. And step four, we start populating the planner database with all the parameters that will not change during scheduling. So my scheduler design uses what's called a weighted scoring model as a decision matrix to prioritize the imaging sequences consists of several key parameters. The first is earlier object setting time. This is used to give priority to the object that was set first in the west, and also because that would have the lowest number of imaging opportunities in the future. Filter priority is number two. This is given the priority over the filter that has the shortest amount of nightly observing time. For example, if luminance have an altitude limit of six degrees, and has a shorter amount of, has a shorter amount of time over what a red filter would go. Red filter would be plus or minus 30 degrees, and of course, in my case, luminance is only plus or minus 60. So I get priority to luminance, and red gets the lowest. Percent subs completed. What I found was that the two top parameters that if you didn't have something to give priority to finishing the plan, you kept bumping the one that was about to get done. So what I did is I added this in that as you get only a few subs remaining to complete your plan, then you get a higher priority so you don't, don't get bumped anymore. Each of these parameters have a, a weighting relative weight assigned to each. And just to note, when you're using such things called a weighted scoring model, uh, fewer parameters is better than too many. If you get too many, it just becomes too difficult to actually get anything out of it. And then I have one non-weighted parameter, which is used in the decision matrix, and that is that it want, I want to maximize imaging time between twilights. So the category score assignments are as follows. Earliest object set time, first object to reach 30 degrees west gets 40, second 30, third 20, or 10, all others get zero. It must add up to 100. Filter priority, lumens gets the highest priority, then blue, green, red, 03, and then uh, for no moon case, again, must add up to 100. And then with the moon up case, hydrogen alpha is 60, sodium is 40, but that's completely arbitrary. You just have to give one priority or the other. And then last, the percent subs completed. If you're 100% Complete, you get zero, less than 40% 10, less than 60% 20, 60 to 90, 30, and a greater than 90, 40. And of course, again, must add up to 100. So the operation is the scheduler takes the planner database, the filter altitude windows that we talked about previously, and adds twilight in and start times, moon rise and set times, 
and then removes any completed optic filter combinations or those that didn't pass the upper const other constraints. So a final result is an imaging window for each object filter combination that meets the filter twilight moon constraints. The schedule then takes the filter priority and percent subs completed scores from the planner, determines the earliest optic setting time scores, and then adds them together to compute the final total score. Schedule then sorts the beginning of each object filter combination imaging windows from earliest to latest then sorts again by total score from highest to lowest. And the highest score then is given priority of all others. There is one final check though, before I actually go and do a find the final schedule. As I take the optic filter combinations with the highest score and check to make sure it straddles the beginning of twilight in. If it does not, it goes down and grabs the second highest score and it continues that until it finds one that passes the check. That one that passes the check becomes the first scheduled object filter combination. Once the first one's been determined, the scheduler starts down the sorted score list and determines which object filter imaging window overlaps the beginning of the previous object's window. If it does, then the object becomes the second scheduled objects and then as it keeps continuing until the entire non-twilight period is filled out, or all object filter combinations have been scheduled. So there are a couple limitations of uh, the program, mainly because I have that non-weighted parameter that gives more priority to objects that start or straddle the twilight end. So the object with the highest combination or highest score but it can be bumped by a second one if it doesn't straddle twilight in. So an example of that is here. So I have two objects. The first one, uh, this is what the auto schedule does. Twilight in for reference is 1822. And we can see the first object starts at 1822. And uh, you can see here, but it doesn't have the highest score. So in this example, the highest score one got bumped because it didn't straddle the twilight end. So this can cause a problem, especially as if you've had bad weather for a few weeks or a month, all of a sudden the one you want to shoot is about to set and this ends up, keep, keeps bumping it. Um, however, it can be changed pretty easily. You just change the, re, just replan and, and schedule. The uh, user can replan and schedule it itself and change that by overriding, or you can actually just change the uh, if you don't like that process, you can just change the, the scores or the relative weights and it reverses back. So you can see here, if you do the processing, increase the weight for the earliest object setting to weight, then it flips back the other way and you get to total score starting first. The downside, of course, is you will not get, in, get imaging until the start of that image, which is at 1900. So you do lose, in this case, about 40 minutes of, skip of imaging. And there's another one that if you don't have enough object filter combinations to begin with, then you can end up with a gap, especially if the moon rises in the middle of the night. So uh, with this giving example that is, is basically this object shooting luminous filter. It has the highest score, scheduled order number one, However, there's nothing after luminance to be scheduled. And H alpha isn't starting until when moon rises at 2022. 20, so you can see in this case is that you have a gap between the end of luminance and the beginning of H alpha. Now, there is ways to fix this by more complicated code in that I can run H alpha when the moon is down just, and it's gonna have lower noise. So in theory, I could, have some code in there to actually bump the 2022 back to 1945, even though the moon isn't up yet. Uh, the downside of this, of course, you have to know what's con what's con what's the constraint on the 2022. If it's altitude, then you can't do much about it. But of course, if it's the moon illumination, then you can. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of the planner scheduler. Now we're going to quickly just go through things that you have to worry about for controlling of your script or program. 
So air handling, if you have a bad RA or deck, you will not slew. If you are below a minimum imaging limit, elevation limit, you will not do an optic, you will abort. The user can stop imaging sequence to return to manual operation. Backup timers for plate solve, weather pause, sensor cool down, and maximum gale freezing. I've had this happen at least once or twice where the script is talking to maximum, doing an exposure, and for whatever reason that communication is lost. And my previous script would just keep going. It's waiting for the exposure and never shuts down. And of course, when that happens, the tracking continues. And luckily, my mount caught it later and, and stopped it. Otherwise, I might have had a peer collision. Another reason I changed and wrote my own script. And then I have user abort mode defines where the mount stops tracking or parks during a weather pause. I choose to park it during a weather pause because there's no guarantee that the weather will get good at the rest of the night. So you might as well just play it safe park it and if the weather gets good and the rip opens then you can start back up again the program actually remembers where it left off and it'll go through and reset itself from a time perspective where it is in the schedule and start back up again and of course i talked about this that you can actually connect some hardware that checks for internet and utility power outages and then if they are lost you can actually abort I haven't really used this a lot, uh, mainly because the power at the DSW is very reliable. Also, I have a UPS system there that if I do use utility power, it backs it up. Uh, so I've been there since March of 2019, and uh, the longest the power outage has been is probably like five seconds. So UPS can handle that very well. So whenever you have a program, you need to have a way to terminate it. So the program terminates if you get the rate to start a script, but the equipment's not powered up, it terminates. If there's no sequences for that evening in the image scheduler, it terminates. If Maxim DL uh, link or the focuser or telescope ASCOM telescope does not connect, it aborts. And of course, it goes into a pause with the weather. Uh, occurs and if the weather never gets better then at twilight start it aborts or fully shuts down and as it's part of the weather pause as i mentioned that if the time at which the weather gets better and the roof opens is beyond the last image sequence of time it aborts if the cooler timeout uh, ex gets exceeded in terms of defining a max cooler power limit like you only allow power limit to be at 90 percent on your cooler then if you can't ever achieve anything lower than 90 percent then it'll, it'll abort if exposure timeouts which basically as i mentioned if you lose max and dl link then it'll abort and stop the program and then also have a plate solve criteria that if it tries twice and of course it's checking on the calculated focal length to ensure that the, so the solution is good then um, it will abort. However, what I have here is the cycling of the roof open and close is kind of a, a pain. So right now I have a, a time period that when the roof closes, I don't declare it's closed for some period of time. When the roof opens, I don't declare it open for some period of time. And so what I found with this max plate solve that if you did the exceedance, and the, the program's waiting to determine whether the roof is open and closed, the program would abort. So I solved the problem by basically doing an immediate check when a plate saw fails to know that the roof, okay, the roof is just closed. That's the reason the plate saw solved. And I just go into weather pause. My program has internal testing capability. This is probably the one thing that's really painful when you're developing a new program is how do you test it? If you don't put it in turn inside the program, you waste a lot of time setting up constraints. And of course, once you get it up and running, you're going to be running the same test over and over and over again. 
So it's best to put that those type of testing in the program internally and control with a flag. So my capability is if mode zero, it runs all code for use of real hardware software. If I put it in mode one, it runs all code using simulators based upon the real schedule output of correct sunset sunrise times. I use this a lot to before I go to real hardware, I run this overnight just to make sure everything's working. And then anytime the mode's greater than one, it's basically using full simulators, but I kind of bypass sunrise and sunset to the current time. So I can run testing any time of the day. and don't have to wait to sunset to begin. This course gets more important as you finally get the scheduler of the program almost completed that now you've got automated program that start to sunset. And so you have to have a way to test during the day. And there's all kinds of sequences in here. You can pick the number of sequences, the number of subs per sequence, put in for weather pause cases, and put for delay of cool down. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Viridian flip testing, which is very important to make sure that algorithm works. You're refocusing test logic. And then of course, cool down tests in terms of roof being open and closed and exiting. So looking at some of the key ones, we're gonna look at Meridian Flip, how I came up to come up with a predicted number of subs for image planner, dither and cool down. So Meridian Flip, a lot of people I see on the forums program into their mount when they want the Meridian Flip to occur. Well, that's fine, but I wanted to use it as the backup. So my script actually commands the Meridian Flip and then if for some reason it doesn't occur, the mount will actually flip at a later time to prevent the peer collision. So what I did is I came up with three windows, which is the first is the Meridian Flip deadband window, Meridian Flip window, and margin. So what I mean is you know, the Meridian Flip deadband is that it begins when the telescope actually points and crosses the Meridian in truth. However, there's always uncertainty. You don't know this precisely. So I have a dead band in there to ensure that I'm past the meridian crossing before I would flip. And then the next is the meridian flip window. This is basically the longest sub exposure you're planning to use. At the end of that, we'll say 30 minutes, then the end of the window it ends there. And then margin is basically is that you've got the mount being commanded as backup and but you want that to be less than the minimum minimum time after marine crossing for the telescope peer collision and that needs to be less than what the ability of your mount to track beyond the meridian so this is just how much margin you want to play to wait for the backup system of the mount to do the meridian flip for you So how it actually works is again, using those three windows. So here's some examples. So if the exposure begins before the marine cl a crossing, of course it goes ahead and exposes. If it actually shows completed during the dead band, it just goes ahead and it does the exposure and completes. If it's complete within the meridian flip window, which it shouldn't be, but just in this example, it will expose. So even if the ending prediction is in the marine flip window, it doesn't flip. If it's completely within the Meridian flip window, it does not flip. So the only time it's going to flip would be whether the end of the Meridian flip window exposure prediction time is beyond the end of the window. And depending upon the exposure time, you could have a case where you've got your exposures uh, for start here. However, it's not going to end until the end of the window but you haven't passed the Meridian Flip dead band window, so you have to wait until that's over with before you actually flip and explode. And of course, as I said, with the margin are usually fine, allows how much margin you want before the mount actually commands back up, back up Meridian Flip. So the derivation of predicted number of subs. Now, as I understand it, I don't know for a fact, but I think uh, ACP does something like this. So as you probably remember, I calculate for an optic filter combination, 
the opening and closing of the window at which it can be observed. So if I have that, I don't know exactly how many predicted sums I'm going to get. So I have to predict. So what does I have to worry about? There's whenever you do, let's say for example, one sub, you've got a huge overhead. You have to have exclude object, plate solve, sync, point corrections, go to and return from focusing star, focusing, imaging free track delays, imaging download times, turning the guider off and on between images. So you have this huge overhead for every sub that you take. So if you increase the number of subs, of course, then your overhead becomes less. Give them numbers for. But I didn't want to go that extreme. I wanted something much simpler. Of course, it's much less accurate. So what I do is, for example, I take six 10-minute exposures and then calculate the total amount of time for all, including all the overhead. So in this example, it comes out to be 10, uh, six, 60 minutes exposures and 72 minutes to expose, to actually complete it. So if you figure that out, that's uh, 12 minutes for exposure, overhead multiplier of 20%. And of course, the more image you take, the number reduces. Now, the reason I use six subs in this example is because I refocus every hour, every six subs. So therefore, the overhead is fairly accurate. So the other thing that you need to know is what is going to be my minimum amount of imaging time that will be allowed. What this comes down to is, again, it comes back to that overhead. Well, let me get that here in a second. So the example here is if I have three subs as my minimum amount, and each sub's 10 minutes times an overhead of 20%, then the minimum time I'm going to allow any object filter combination to expose is 36 minutes in the scheduler. So another reason that you want something greater than one is that let's suppose you have one more sub to complete your project. However, you shoot that sub, the next day you go look at it, oh my gosh, it's a bad sub. So now I have to go back and, and tell the program to reshoot it. So it's better that the overhead is sufficient that if you just have one sub, and what it means is if you don't have the overhead, there's no guarantee the next attempt will be any better. So you might as well shoot something like three as your minimum, so that at least you have two other attempts to get the good sub and complete your project. For dithering, there's multiple types of how to do dither. These are just three that I've come up with. First of all, I call lucky dither. You know, we have lucky imaging for planets. Well, I came up with Lucky Dither, and this is using the mount's ability to achieve a precise RAN deck by slewing to desired right essential declination of each image. Or when you refocus, you go to a focus star and come back. So you, you don't come back exactly where we left off. So therefore, you have some variability in Dither, although generally speaking, if you're auto-guiding, you're not, it's not going to be very large. Then there's geometric spiral, which we'll discuss along with random here, one axis, two axis, the next chart. So my geometric spiral dither analysis is as follows. So the first image of the night is at the zero, zero offset. So at the true RA and deck. Second image is two, three, four, five. And then when I get to six, I jump up to the next ring at seven, go around, complete that ring that jumps up to eight and just continues. So this works good for probably a CCD type of cameras for the night, but if you're now converted to CMOS and you're shooting, you know, high hundreds of images or even a hundred, then this dither could get fairly large and may not be practical. So for example, a three ring dither gives you 36 inches, a four ring dither gives you 61. And of course, you can make the dither distances any difference uh, in this example, I ran a six pixel dither. On the random side, I did a little test to see how much, what's the probability distribution in terms of what can I guarantee as a number of uh, distance between image to image for a dither. You can think of the distance I have here as either pixels or arc seconds in this example. So I ran 500 random numbers determining different 
how far each of those in terms of RA and DEC was from each other, generate a probability distribution, and then determine the percentage of the distances below that value. So you can see here the table for a one axis random number. I have distances plus or minus one, two, three, four, five, six. Just think of those as being pixels. So for example, if I want a six pixel difference in my dither, then, and I have a one axis of putting in six pixels, essentially is my random number generator, then I only get a 70% chance, or actually 30% chance of getting six pixel variation. You got a 70% chance of not getting six pixels. You double that from six to 12, it goes down to 40. Three times, you got to 30. 4x, which would be 24 pixels in this example, would be down to 24% of the time, you would below six pixels. However, if you go to two axis, then it gets much better. So again, go down to the distance of six pixels, it drops to 45 for two, two x is 12, three x is six, four x gets down to three. So this would give you a 3% chance of having your dither distance of being less than six pixels. So, you know, you can go to any level with this. And of course, there's different ways to do your random numbers. And of course, you know, a lot of people don't dither every image. So therefore, it's not as, as critical. Okay, now we're gonna move on to how I do my cool down logic from an automatic standpoint. So first of all, if you remember curve back from your charts, I said I was for each of my object plan, I was specifying what temperature I wanted to shoot at. Well, that doesn't always become practical. So I came up with an automated version of actually letting the program calculate it based upon what the temperature is for that evening. So let's assume every, you know, every so many months you run dark frame calibration files and you run them at a variable, you know, variable temperatures. So in this example, let's assume you shoot at minus 25, minus 20, minus 15, minus 10, and that's in your database. So you might as well then will shoot. This is what I'm going to be shooting my calibration fans at, temperatures at. So why not use that as what I try to cool down to? So in this example, I'm at ambient temperature of eight degrees. My cooler has a capacity of minus 25 degrees below ambient. So if you subtract that, that says with eight degree ambient temperature, I can get down to minus 17. So when I come over to my table, I say, okay, which of my values in my table is greater or cooler than minus 17? It turns out to be minus 20. So I attempt to cool down to minus 20. And if I can't meet the maximum power level, like 90% that I want, then it goes back to minus 15. If it can't meet that, then it jumps to minus 10. And of course, if it can't meet minus 10, then it basically aborts. Another example is, is that let's assume you got tired of running dark frame calibrations for a multiple pool of temperatures. So you're gonna shoot one temperature for year round. Let's assume that's minus 20. We're going back to our example again, minus eight degrees Celsius ambient, cooler capacity is 25, which says at this particular moment, I can get to minus 17. But wait a minute, I can't get to minus 20 yet. What do I do? So in this case, what happens, you have to wait until the end of temperature drops to be able to get the temperature to cool down. And it's, it's always a challenge, especially um, in New Mexico there in terms of between August and July, February, uh, January, February, March, when it can drop to almost zero temperatures to have one temperature for year round. Okay, so, when we're running my script, of course, I'm using Maximum DL and Focus Max, which, as I understand it, is, um, uh, SCP also requires. Um, so you have to make some changes because you're now running Maximum DL in what I'll call native mode. When I was running my previous script, you didn't have these settings. But when I ran Maximum DL by itself uh, with my own script, I had to have these checkboxes here. One thing I found that 
Maxim DL in um, native mode was that my previous script it created it it computed its own guide star cal own guide stars and did all the auto calibration and um, uh, how to do the calibration and so when I try to use the same thing with Maxim by itself I kept getting you know it kept picking the hot pixels and I couldn't get past that and then I was told it was like well you have to have a shutter on your guide camera and I had to start taking darks and I go I'm like well that's nice my guide camera doesn't have one of those so and I'm at a remote site so I can't go out there and do that all the time so I jumped to multi-star guiding and jumped to uh, bin 2 for my guide star and that completely resolved my problem I haven't gone back to try whether I can do a single star in uh, bin 2 or not multi-stars guiding has been working fine for me uh, so I've been sticking with it the other thing is I think I mentioned earlier is that Maxim DL script capability doesn't allow you to open the tracking window or the planetarium window. So you have to do that manually. And Focus Max is pretty much self-sufficient. If you got that up and working, you can just leave it alone. Okay, so that's kind of the end of my program. I kind of want to give you some fun type of things you may like to see case you haven't done them. One is data capture statistics. So this is the statistics of the time for temperature change by one degree Celsius. I know a lot of people use one degree as one time to refocus. So I ran from August 10th to November of 21. I gathered all the data every night and multiple times throughout the night. What's the statistics? So I create a histogram for how many hours between one degree change. And you can see from the current perspective that almost everything you're gonna be continually refocusing within the first hour for sure. And even with the first two hours, you're gonna have all your focusing, refocusing to occur. However, when you get beyond two hours, you see it starts to, all becomes flat after about three and a half hours after twilight end. And of course that makes sense because what the earth has been warm has been sunset the earth is still hot so the earth has to cool off and that's what's causing you to have to refocus all the time because the temperature is changing and of course if you do the cumulative probability you can see for one hour you've got a 60 a 55 percent chance of having a refocus and at, at two hours you've got 85 percent probability of having a refocus and of course when you get up as i mentioned below four hours you almost can go the rest of the night with having to refocus. So my future plans are one is to get Gmail back up and working. I also want to add capability to run my narrow band, narrow filter, narrow telescope and wide filter, wide telescope images and the same, uh, have the, excuse me, have the script uh, to plan and schedule to whether my narrow my narrow bit filter, narrow field of view, or the wide field of view cameras and telescopes. The next is I'm going to make it open source. So if someone wants it to improve upon it, which I'm sure there is, I'm not a professional programmer, so I'm sure there's all kinds of ways to make this better than what I did. Also, this was the first time I've ever, ever done a programming like this, so I had to learn everything from scratch. And then last, I've always had a cap always wanted the capability. I want to shoot narrow and wide images at the same time. So that's my future plans if I ever get there. Okay, just here, another few more slides and I'll complete. So just if you're going to do remotes, you may look at some unique equipment that you need. So the first is when I had my local observatory, I use a laptop to by the telescope and then remote it into the warm room with, with another computer. Well, that's fine, but if you're gonna go remote, usually you need a lot of USBs. And with the observatory one, I always had a USB data hub. When I was going remote, I wanted to get rid of another piece of equipment. 
of course, I got a PC with eight USBs. Of course, the hub, which has actually moved from its external hub to internal, but got rid of a piece of equipment that I didn't need. So I bought a shuttle PC. Of course, nowadays, I'm sure some of you have gone to the really mini PCs that's out there. They're really tiny that can run Windows 10 and all that. You're going to need a Power Pro switch that can be called from the web. You can plug your equipment into it and then control and, and recycle equipment if you have to recycle your equipment. Uh, the downside of this is not ASCON compatible. So you have to learn to use what's called curl and bat file, files. Don't ask me what that is. I, I implemented it, but I don't understand what it actually does except work. You may want to reduce the number of cables up to your telescope, maybe to your mount. If you have a power box up there for data and power, you only have to run the power data up to the box and then smaller link cables to all your cameras, focusers, and two straps. And when I first was going out there, I was really concerned about losing home position. My AP mount doesn't have home position in it. So I was really concerned about losing it. How am I going to get it back if it's you know, 900 miles away? So I did some research and came up with an inclinometer. So it's a tiny little thing, probably the size of a half dollar. Pretty accurate, like a hundredth of a degree, uh, I guess, yeah, hundredth of a degree resolution. And I applied this to the back bulkhead of my telescope. And so when I have it in park position, I turn it on, note down what it's telling me for the two level angles. And then if I ever lose home position, I can just use and control the computer to have the control to move Ari and deck to get me back close to home position and then be able to get to do a plate solve and hopefully I'm close enough to make that work. Since I've been out there for almost four years now, I've had to use this three times. Uh, the two of the three times occurred when I first was starting. I didn't know what I was doing as much. So I had this happen a couple of times. Also, it happened because I was using my old script. I think I told you about Max and DL uh, Wasp. It's I stopped communicating with my script and it not kept going. Luckily, I caught it before it collided. Um, since the first two times, I really haven't had it occur again. Last thing you may want to play around with, if you want, let's say you have your own observatory, you're not sure utility power is always going to be there for you, you can put a board in there that you hook utility power to, and then connect your computer or script to that, and then when you lose power, then if you have a UPS, you can then save your equipment before you lose complete power. This is a Wi-Fi enabled board. It didn't work for me because I'm in a group observatory, so I got an Ethernet enabled board, so I have to worry about Wi-Fi interference. And that's the end. So is there any other questions or anything that? You know? uh, David, somebody asked, uh, what language did you program this in? This is the visualbasic.net. Um, the story is from back from that reason I did that was because I had been doing Excel uh, programming for years and years and years. And I had all the astronomical equations in Visual Basic. So I didn't want to have to transform all those into C and learn C in the first place because I didn't know C++. So I just felt it was much easier to go from where I learned or where I knew and then just learn VB.net versus Visual Basic that you do for Excel. Uh, can I ask, I mean, this is kind of an aside, but how many nights a year do you generally uh, image at Deep Sky West? Uh, that, uh, there's two answers to that. If you want to know how many nights the roof is open all night, I'd say about 15% of the time the roof is open all night. If you want just that the roof is open sometime during the night, then you're up around 40 to 50% of the time. But if the roof is open and closing, that's usually an indication that your weather is not that good and you may not be able to really get much data that you can keep.
Um, one of the questions that's being asked is he the, one of the um, um, Molly. It looks like Molly's asking it. Uh, is um, that a, a twelve hundred dollar or the AP twelve hundred? You got a twelve hundred in there or an eleven hundred? Twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. Uh, how come the AP twelve hundred doesn't have um, a inclinometer on it as it is? Um, well, just a lot of other mounts, uh, even some of my Celestron mounts have a home have home position switches, so that yeah. you can always at least home them, even if the mount gets lost. It boggles my it boggles me that the super fancy astrophysics mounts don't have a home position switch or an index or anything like that. It, well, I can't understand it. <laughs> all, all the new APs do. Uh, my version don't, although I think APCC, or may, excuse me, there's a firmware update to 1200 that will actually put a home position in there. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah there's, there, um, it's just an additional, uh, it's just an addition to the AP 1200. And yeah, so like, you, like, can, that, you can put like, it in. Is that like the GTO four or whatever? I really don't know. No, it's um, it's called the, the encoders, I think. Uh, oh, tried to, they try to the sell encoders. it to me every time I go to Neve. So well, you know, yeah, okay. I just, I just encoders, never bought sure, it. <laughs> well, that that's. I mean, of course, the high end mount has encoders, and then you don't have to worry about it. You're always going to have home position. Yeah. Um, the one. But the upgrade to that twelve hundred mount to encoders is. Oh. Not inexpensive. Yeah, and like my two thousand dollar Ioptron mount has a home position for goodness sake and no encoders, so I don't get it. Come on, astrophysics. <laughs> well, actually, the astrophysics they do have something like a home position, but if you get lost, yeah, you lose the ability to go to that home position. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in fact, unless you have encoders or an inclinometer, you know, their home position in the standard. Uh, I don't know which version of the software you have. Doesn't really do you any good. Yeah. Do you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see our video feeds again? Okay. Sorry. Right. Molly, are you saying that your mount has a switch that even if it's lost, even if somebody's whacked the top of the mount, it still knows to get back to its home position and the telescope right. is in the right position? Yeah, yeah, it's got like a sensor in it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just also just know my 1200 mount is like, 10 years old, so it wasn't. Yeah. Hey, David, not. could you stop sharing? Uh, this, oops, you got one more button press. Hit yeah, there you, go. there you go. Perfect. All right, you're back. Uh, we've got some other questions. For one, there was a question among several of the fellows out there, some of the some of the people out there, as to, well, you've got a, a TPO 12-inch RC F56, and you've got a um, what for the refractor? It's a, a 380 millimeter. Well, it's got a reducer on it, but so I'm running at 380, which is like four points f 4.6. A 380, 380 millimeter. Yeah. Is is that with the reducer on it or without yes. the reducer? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It has That's a, a is that a focal length? 380. Yeah, focal length is 380. Oh, what I think the question was: what brand and type and stuff like that. What, William Optic. With the William Optic. Okay. okay. Um, uh, and then there's a question of um, uh, who's in charge of the roof? Uh, Tim Myers asks, since there are multiple users, does someone monitor the roof open uh, versus weather to protect all the scopes under that roof? Yes. Uh, the owner of the observatory um, monitors every night, and they have someone that's kind of keeping track to the night. Of course, it automatically closes if the weather gets really bad, but they have someone double checking to make sure if weather gets bad, the roof is actually closing because you can always have a mechanical problem and the roof won't close. So you gotta be able to handle that. Um, and uh, are you, is this software being released? Is it shareware or what is it when you're well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make it open source. I have to finish the documentation on it so people can actually know how to use it and what's inside of it. So I'm working on that now. So it'll okay. be in the near future, I'll have it open source. And uh, Jeff wants to know, will it be available for various cameras, et cetera? As, as long as your camera can be connected to Maxim DL, you should be good. Okay. So um, this requires Maxim DL as part yeah, of Yeah, it's just like ACP, you have to have Maxim DL and Focus Max. And, um, and uh, ASCOM? 
Oh yeah, of course ASCOM. Yes. Okay, and um, uh, let me see. Oh, you want to take pictures with your wide field camera and your uh, TPO at the same time. Right. When you're doing that, you're going to be dithering. How are you going to control the dithering for that? Well, my my plan, of course, that's the plan until I actually do it. It may not occur. My plan is I'm going to be shooting the narrow uh, camera, narrow field camera, longer than the color camera, and I'll be dithering with the main main telescope. And I'll just have to make the dither large enough that's compatible with the you know the pixel size of the small camera. Okay. Um, so you don't plan to uh, monitor the two cameras and when they're both finished, go ahead with the dither and start them back up again for the next exposure or sets of exposures. Well, it, it would, yes. Um, I just don't know how much time for you. Like, for example, I'll start off with probably 15 minute subs for the narrow filter, narrow telescope, and the wide field will probably be 10. Since, what, uh, about, what about guiding? All the guiding will be done with through the main scope. And I, you know, I know there's an offset between the, the piggyback camera, but that's with a wide field camera that's going to be insignificant. Um, can you, when, before you release this thing, are you going to add roof control so that those who aren't in a uh, observatory controlled by the group? Uh, can be uh, turn their own roof, open their own roof, and close their roof. Well, all all they have to do is is meet the standard for the roof text file. Data come from the roof text for all automated roofs, and it goes directly in the program. So, so all all you need is just access to the text file for the roof, which is almost independent of my program, except for the text file, of course. Would that be part of Maxim's job? Oh no, no, my script is that. Okay, that's your answer, Don and Paul and Elizabeth. So, um, is there any reason you're not going to astronomical night? Uh, no, I am. You going are going to astronomical? I thought. Well, I, I think in one of the charts I just had said twilights, but no, I'm doing astronomical yeah, twilights. Okay. Patrick wants to know what's uh, how do you handle the imaging data. Oh, good point. So the, uh, I have a folder on my remote computer, and so all the images gets loaded to it. And then um, this is called a future thing, is to be able to actually send it to me so it's waiting for me in the morning, but that's not there. So basically, I just have to, next morning I get up, log in, download through Google, Google Drive all my images, and then start processing. Okay. So how are we doing? I think we've got all the questions. I think we got everything. And thanks uh, to, you know, for fixing it up there in the middle. It was, we do not know and we won't know till tomorrow or next week. If we ever know some of these things, we never know what actually happened. But we will somehow, we've got both halves of the present, both parts of the presentation, and we will somehow make sure that you can watch the whole show. Great. Okay. Um, do we have anything else we need to do tonight, guys? No. Who's running the show? Molly or you? Or uh, doesn't sound like anybody was there for a while. Uh, the uh, I think. Well, it all started off with uh, Patrick being in charge of the show. So thank you, Patrick. And then Terry and Molly, when we realized it was messed up, both jumped in. Uh, Patrick's and... been running the show the whole time. I just helped make a new, a new show instance and other okay. stuff, but. We've had, that, we've had a pretty fraught day, so. <laughs> in other words, we don't really know what happened. So we just did our best, like we always do here. So, um, so we're done. We're done. We're done. We we're done. We got to say goodbye. Right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Yay. everybody. <laughs> See ya. Thanks we for made it. Back.